Welcome everyone, um, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. This is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. Go there, click on this, check, uh, check it out. We have a lot of amazing events. Uh, maybe not so many announced, but keep an eye on this page. We will put more events there. And of course, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, do it now, you will get notified about all our future videos like this one. And last but not least, we have an amazing Slack community. If you want to hang out with other data enthusiasts, join it and you can ask questions, you can answer questions, you can network with people. It's an amazing place, join it. And then I said that that was the last one, but actually it's not. I forgot that we actually have a course about MLOps. It's not re it's somewhat related to data engineering, I guess. Um, but yeah, if you're interested about putting machine learning to production, we have a free course about this. Check the link. And then this one is the last one. If you have any questions, um, you can ask them using the link in, in the live chat. It's pinned. Just click on this link, ask your question, and we will be covering these questions after the presentation. So now I stop sharing my screen, and now, Jeff, the floor is yours. Great. Um, oh, do you mind just enabling screen sharing, Alexi? Of course I don't. I keep forgetting this. Now you should be able to do this. Cool. It should be on by default, right? I don't need to do this every time. Yeah, there is a way, but I, I'm the same way. I also <laughs> just do it every time. Um, so yeah, so my name is Jeff. Uh, I run a data engineering bootcamp called Jigsaw Labs. Uh, as I was talking with Alexi beforehand, uh, this school originally started three years ago actually teaching data science, but we saw that more and more employers were looking for data engineers and that in particular for entry level students that we found that data engineering was just a really good profession to break into the data world uh, in and with that skill set. Uh, so we changed the curriculum, changed the course, uh, and you know rebuild a course on data engineering. Uh, we just graduated the second cohort uh, with the first cohort. All the students did really well; they all got jobs. And then with the second cohort, we graduated a few weeks ago, but. Students, again, have been doing really well. We actually had a student get hired a couple of months before we even finished the course. So it's a really good profession um, to be breaking into, particularly for beginners. And just like kind of setting expectations for the talk, I'm going to be talking about this, uh, about breaking in, into data engineering or getting a data engineering job as if you're entering the profession. So for people kind of getting entry level data engineering jobs not for the mid-level or senior jobs. Uh, if you're getting a mid-level or senior data engineering job, the chances are you probably already know uh, what you need to do to get that kind of job. But if, you know, at the end, if you want me to go into more into that, I can, we can talk about that. So the first thing is just understanding, you know, what do you actually do as a data engineer and what is the data engineering stack, right? So you might've seen these uh, this different, these different technical skills that are listed, but, you know, seeing how they all fit together. So on the left, you can see, right, like mainly what a data engineer is doing is just pulling in data from different data sources, loading it into a data warehouse, and then transforming that data, right? So that uh, teams can perform analytics on it. Data engineers are sometimes asked to do a lot of the bulk of that analytics work, uh, but this is essentially the building the reports uh, as the output and taking in, you know, messy data from various sources as the input. So to do that, you know, here you have, you know, the Python code. Uh, a lot of times you want to deploy this uh, if you're, say, running a scraper or hitting various APIs, right? And the way that you deploy that is using Docker and then deploying it with a cloud service like AWS or Google Cloud. Um, you want to store the data in a data lake or in staging, right? Oftentimes you'll do that with S3. Um, and then ultimately you want that data to land in a data warehouse so that you can query it. And typically you'll see either, I'd say it's Snowflake is the, is the, the most popular data warehouse right now, but you also see Redshift and BigQuery um, as other options. And then once the data is loaded into the data warehouse, 
you then want to make sure that you're cleaning the data, that you're um, transforming the data, coercing it so that, that the data is more or less looking the same uh, as you get it from different sources, and that you organize the data, right? You need to perform data modeling, you need to uh, create what we call like data marts, um, so that teams can then look at the uh, at the data. And lots of times you'll have to connect it to a data dashboard like Looker, um, is probably the most popular now. Tableau is also very popular. Mode is an open source tool, um, or at least a free tool that you can use. Um, oh, and then finally, Airflow, right? So an orchestrator. So Airflow Prefect is an alternative as well, Dagster. Uh, but this is what automates, right? The running the scraper, loading the data into S3, then into something like Redshift. And then, right, you can let DBT also uh, you, know, you can kick off a DBT workflow and it can also then start to perform uh, coercing of the data, right? So you can automate this uh, with an orchestrator like Airflow, right? So this involves obviously like various skill sets, but the main skills, and you'll see this, you know, again in the talk that you'll want to focus on is Python and SQL, okay? Like uh, so much, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of different projects that you'll see that have kind of this whole flow, but the main skill, again, that you're going to be, that, you know, I would be looking for, or employers are going to be looking for is Python and SQL. And you can see that, so we scraped 700 data engineering positions uh, from indeed.com in uh, just this past April. And you can see, right, SQL and Python are at the very top, AWS is cloud service provider. Um, Spark, you do see there. I, you know, I talked about this in the last talk with Alexi. I generally don't focus on this for beginners because anecdotally, uh, we haven't seen it come up in interviews uh, with at least entry level data engineering jobs, like junior data engineer uh, positions. But again, like if you want to have some familiarity with it, that's fine. Um, but I, I like skills that reinforce kind of cloud computing, SQL, Python, right? You can see the other things uh, listed here, right? Snowflake, we saw um, NoSQL also notably is further down on the list and then anecdotally haven't seen it asked too much in interviews. This is what we do see all the time in technical interviews. So just to, we'll talk more about this later on, but just to kind of get to, uh, what a lot of you might be curious about, it's mostly SQL. So probably two thirds, the breakdown is probably two thirds SQL, one third Python questions. Uh, and then if you are looking for sample problems, it's, you know, leak code, medium to hard. Um, and then, you know, the topics are obviously, you know, relational queries, sub queries and aggregate functions, window functions come up a lot. Uh, CTEs is, you know, how you'll write, uh, you know, your code in DBT, so you, you should know that as well. Um, and then data modeling, right? So how, how actually should you organize the tables, right? And do you know OLTP design versus OLAP design? And a good book, I think, for at least learning OLTP design and, and practicing this, I have beginning database design. And then finally, you know, in the Python side, Lead Code Beginner, so it's a little bit less demanding on the Python side is what we found. And we have a couple of resources here, but we'll, we'll get back to this. Okay, so to start off, um, you know, it, you are entering a good field, uh, data engineer. This is from 2020 uh, DICE report. Uh, they found it to be the fastest growing prof technical profession, right? Another great thing is that because data engineering, to become a data engineer, you're focused on, on Python and SQL. That means that oftentimes you are qualified for a backend engineering role as well. In fact, like about a third of our graduates end up taking on a backend developer role. And then if by scraping the Indeed uh, listings, we looked at years of experience. We find that breaks down pretty evenly. So there are entry-level positions available as data engineers. So then why is it difficult you know, to become a data engineer? Why, why would I even have to give this talk? Um, the main thing is that people are, employers are gonna be you know, concerned that you just won't be able to contribute when you join their team, right? Um, that's the main kind of concern that I'll hear is, okay, if we hire them and we put them in front of the computer and our code base, will they actually be able to make uh, contributions? So you want to show that you are a data engineer and you want to essentially become a peer of the other data engineers. You want when you go on interviews that they look at you as a data engineer, right? And that means that 
you, you know, I break this down to two things that you talk the talk and that you get the skills. The easiest one is, you know, talking the talk, or at least I think it's the thing that uh, requires less effort. Um, so there are a couple of books that I recommend um, just so that you start understanding the terms and, uh, you know, uh, the workflow and different options that you have as a data engineer, the tech stack better, um, the data pipelines pocket reference. Another book that's good is The Informed Company. Um, I, you know, I've, these are both pretty recent books. Uh, they're fairly easy reads. They're meaning they're not super long books. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I recommend them. Um, and then, you know, becoming part of like the data engineering community, whether that's data talks club, a lot of the uh, tools that you'll see, they have Slack channels. So I recommend that you join their Slack channels and that you monitor them pretty you know, regularly and read some of the blog posts and pay attention to the discussions that they have. Um, the other thing is just conferences, you know, like PyCon is, is great. There's the ML Ops conferences coming up. For PyCon, for a lot of these conferences, the talks will be on YouTube. So, uh, you know, go watch the talks, watch them, you know, have them on your phone in the background or something like that. It's, it's a good way for you to kind of hear about what's going on, uh, you know, in data engineering, but a lot of it's in, you know, overlaps with software engineering, if it's Python and SQL as the main uh, focus. And then same thing, when you network with people, you want to start to get deeper into that community, right? So when you talk to data engineers or chat with them on Slack or, you know, set up, you know, phone calls with them, ask them, you know, hey, what books, are there any books or resources that you think would be good for me to learn? Um, are there other like data engineer communities that you're a part of or communities in general, like engineering communities you're a part of that you recommend, right? This could be like meetups or Slack communities, uh, things like that. Um, is there anything else or anyone else you know who would be useful for me to talk to. So actually, you know, maybe they have another contact. So this way you can start to expand uh, your network and kind of get deeper into the community. And then when you um, start talking to other data engineers, they'll be like, oh, like I read that book too, right? Like you'll, you'll start sounding and will be more and more of a peer. I think like every community has like a couple of like, I don't know, like core books, I guess, uh, of like books that you'll see people just have read. So I, I worded this as like, have you read the books, right? Um, actually got, you know, this line actually comes from uh, like a sports journalist because like when he sees people breaking into sports journalism, one thing he'll ask is, okay, well, have you read the books, like the classics and sports journalism? And one thing I love about that is, you know, it's not about, you know, necessarily a degree or, or your grades, like anyone can do this. Um, so for data engineering, you know, I have these three books. These two are the really data engineering ones. So designing data intensive applications. This book is pretty long. Uh, it goes into, you know, the ins and outs of how databases work under the hood and different options for databases. Uh, I still think it's, it is informative. And if you start reading just, you read even a portion of the book, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, you don't have to read it cover to cover, I'd say. Uh, I'd say that's even less, even more the case with Kimball, uh, but you should know what Kimball is. Uh, you should be like, I'd say it's worth reading a few chapters of Kimball. I think after that, you can kind of get the point. Um, but this talks about, you know, database design and OLAP. Um, and, and uh, you know, when people mention Kimball, you should definitely know what that is. And then finally, this you probably wouldn't see in the list of data engineering books, but you will see it in engineering books in general. And that's the, the Gang of Four book, right? And being a data engineer, more and more you'll see people say, I want software engineers, right? When I hire, uh, when I talk to hiring managers, I'll say, well, really I want a software engineer. Um, or you'll even see the listing as software engineer comma data, right? And for software engineers, um, this is you know, known as like the gang of four book. There are more kind of books uh, on object oriented software, but this is, this is a good starting point that's used across languages. Uh, meaning like Python, Ruby, Java, right? You'll you'll see this book. All right. Um, so then, you know, walk the walk is, you know, actually build a project. And this takes a lot longer than reading the books, um, but uh, it's, it's more important as well, right? It, it's essential uh, that you do this. And the main thing I'd say, you know, you have this whole tech stack, but the main thing that I'm kind of really highlighting is Python and SQL. Uh, one other thing to mention is that 
And you'll hear this too. If you choose, you know, Google BigQuery instead of AWS, if you choose, uh, you know, you know, or Google Cloud instead of AWS and BigQuery instead of Snowflake, uh, if you choose Prefect instead of Airflow, that's not a huge deal. I, I think that's fine. Um, you know, like maybe you'll get a slight bump if when people see exactly those skills line up, but most hiring managers will be fine with you using any of these. I don't, uh, I don't uh, teach students Looker because it's so expensive to uh, use it right now and it is pretty complicated. So mode generally works fine, Tableau works fine. Um, but what, so, you know, these tech, this tech stack is kind of, you can trade off certain tools that for, per your preference. The main thing and the main kind of issue I see when looking at student projects, um, and this goes not only for data engineering, but engineering in general, is, you know, when I see people post projects on LinkedIn or, or Reddit or things like that, I'll, you know, I'm clicking through to their code and seeing very quickly, like, okay, what does their code look like? Can they write good Python? Can they write, you know, what are their SQL queries look like? And quite often, meaning maybe half to even more uh, of the times that I do so, there's not a lot of Python or SQL code just even to look at, all right? So for Python, a good benchmark is like 300 lines of code, at least. Like, I don't think that's actually too much to ask for. Um, sometimes I'll really see hardly any. Uh, and then same thing with SQL, you know, have a, a couple hundred lines, maybe a hundred lines of SQL code. Um, we're looking at the quality of, of like clean code. Uh, when you see more advanced people's code, maybe you'll see, like I, so I put in here just some basic qualifications to write clean functions, keep them five lines or fewer, use object-oriented programming and keep your objects a hundred lines or fewer, right? You'll definitely see more advanced engineers uh, experienced engineers, you know, not even consider this a rule, let alone break this rule. But I think that what you will see is engineers will organize their code. Even though their functions are longer, they'll break them into chunks of about five lines. And they, they know, you know, this is really good starting point uh, to keep code this way. It's still how I write my code personally. Um, so I would recommend it, you know, it, it's it's a way that will keep your code clean. Um, if you just keep your function small, keep your objects small. And if you Google like small code, you'll see that this is something that engineers really aspire to. The other thing is like descriptive names. This goes for your variables, for your functions, right? Like if you write something list or something dict, you know, like all, all over the place, that's really gets to be confusing code. You want people to, your code should be readable. That's the main thing that we're looking for is that you have readable code. We want to say that you can, you know, write tests. Um, so I know that you'll see people debating on Twitter about what to test, but they're not debating really whether or not you should write tests. If you, if there's a code base and it has zero tests in it, it's hard for me to believe that it's really something I can rely on. Right. And if you're putting this into production, like how can you, you know, like how, how can I really be confident that this is going to work? Right. So, uh, you know, showing showing this, the, uh, like checking these things off, your code will start to look pretty good and, and, and more and more like professional code. Um, same thing, descriptive git commits, just don't write like, init, you know, commit, second commit, you know, just take a second to specify what you're actually uh, are doing in that commit and, you know, have, put your code into organized folders. If you want to see some examples, you know, the prefect code base is open source. 18F is a government organization. They write really clean code. Um, you can browse around and see, you know, their repos uh, as examples. And then build your analytics in SQL, right? Like you know, there's a lot of opportunities for you. If you do the analytics, you know, how many users per month, how much monthly revenue, uh, you know, uh, most popular products or revenue per product, things like that. You know, these are all SQL queries that you should be able to write. Um, you know, in DBT, you can write tests for these as well. And then I say next level is for your project, get a client, like, you know, build something for one other person or for one business for free. Right. And they'll start asking, you know, Hey, could you do something like this? Could you do something like that? And that will be demanding uh, of you. You know, they might ask something that's pretty tricky for you to figure out, but it's worth it. And when you talk on interviews, it will feel, you know, real that you know how to take some uh, client specifications and translate them into code. 
I say even better is open source, you know, so after, if you build an initial project, going into, you know, some uh, making contributions to open source is, is really good. Uh, you'll hear this recommendation a lot and a few people follow it. So just to specify, you know, why it's really good, it shows that you can work with a large unfamiliar code base, right, which is the job of an engineer. It will, you'll learn a lot from it. It will enforce good pro coding practices because people will have to accept your commits, right? So that means lots of times they won't do so unless you write tests. Uh, you'll need, you know, good branching strategy. You'll have to write clean commits uh, and good commit messages. And then employers can click and see your code, right? And, and see that, okay, this is the work that you actually did. Um, so, you know, you know, this is really a good opportunity for you. In terms of how do you, you know, it does take time to find a good open source project, meaning it can take like a few days, uh, maybe, maybe like 15 hours, something like it can take some real time to find a good open source project. But what you're looking for is like ETL projects. So a project that has a scraper, has to hit APIs. Uh, you want to find an active project, meaning they made a commit, you know, within a month. A month is actually kind of long, maybe like a, a week or two uh, is a lot better. Um, you want to make sure that it's a pretty quality project in terms of the code base. So there should be some tests. It doesn't have to be fully uh, scoped out and tested, but there should be, you know, some tests that are there. And then the other thing is you want to be able to connect with the community to make sure that, okay, your pull requests will be uh, merged in, right? And that you are working on an active issue and things like that. And so if, if the open source uh, project has a Slack, has a meetup that meets online, has a contributor that you can email, uh, that's really useful, right? And I would say like, that's almost a prerequisite in terms of to make sure that this will be successful. Uh, good, good places to look for this is, you know, Code for America. Um, also, Civic Issues is a Twitter account that will mention, uh, you know, different uh, uh, non-for-profit work that, that needs help, right? And then next level, I'd say this is more challenging is, you know, Prefect, like we mentioned, is open source. Singer Taps, uh, those are open source. So you can make contributions. Uh, to those. But I think, you know, if you're starting out, if you haven't made open source contributions yet, start with just ETL projects, projects where they're scraping uh, or hitting APIs, storing the data, right, and, and start to make contributions to them. Okay, so now that, you know, we've talked about how you become a peer, about talking the talk, about kind of like walking the walk with building projects, right, it's, you know, you start applying. Um, I say you can just a, like a one note, it's okay for you to start applying before you're ready, just to see like a bit about like what you're in for uh, and, and a way to find out where your weaknesses are. Um, but you should think about it, you know, your application process, obviously, like as a funnel, meaning, you know, you have bottom of the funnel, middle of the funnel, later round, and then finally an offer. And doing this should, you know, allow you just put like a little bit of thought as to, okay, like, how many opportunities are you getting through to the interview stage? How much do I have to apply to get to have like two or three active interviews, right? Because that's kind of about where you want to be uh, when you're applying for jobs is have kind of like uh, about like two or three um, interviews or at least warm leads there. Um, and then also see like, where are you getting stuck, right? Like maybe your applicant, maybe you're, uh, you're not, you're not ready to start applying because you just don't have uh, those projects or that experience quite yet. Um, maybe you're getting stuck at, at a certain stage in the interview process. So thinking through this is going to be helpful for you. Um, just like some good benchmarks is, you know, behavioral, I'd say like 60%, right? Um, if, if you're not around, you know, 50 plus percent in behavioral interview, it's good for you to think about that, you know, talk, you know, do some of these questions with a friend, um, see where you could be improving it. First round technical, I'd say, you know, same thing, around 40 to 50 percent. Uh, there will be some that maybe you're just, you know, unprepared for or difficult, but um, like the SQL Python questions, if you're in that mode, that's pretty good. And then final round, I honestly feel is unpredictable. Like, like you want to get to the final round. And once you get to the final round, do your best. But people, you know, tech companies, uh, it's very hard to diagnose what and really know what happened in the final round of the interview. So your goal is to get to the final round. Some of them will work out. Some of them just won't. All right. But if you get are getting to the final rounds in like two or three, that's that's great. 
All right. So bottom of the funnel, you know, LinkedIn, like the first step, the easiest step for you to do is clean up your LinkedIn profile. Like this is definitely low hanging fruit. Um, so make sure you have a photo that you claim that you are a data engineer. Um, have an about section that mentions data engineering and the projects that you've worked on, right? Like even if you have another, like this, you have to kind of claim that this is your position, even if you're transitioning into it. And then finally, like the engineering skill section, um, you can add, I believe, up to 50 skills on LinkedIn and recruiters will look for those skills, right? They'll, they have searching tools that you may not be subscribed to. And so they'll look to see, okay, DBT, Postgres, Snowflake, right? Uh, Airflow, Prefect, they'll be looking for that. And if you don't have it, they, just, they're not, they don't know any better. They're not going to, uh, you know, assume that you necessarily have it. You just simply won't show up in their search. So, so you know, clean this up um, so that, that, you know, people will start finding you and reaching out to you. In my experience, recruiters do that, even for entry-level people. Um, finally, before we'll get into, like, the resume, obviously, now, too. But one thing I wanted to highlight, you know, when we scraped all those uh, data engineering jobs, a lot of the skills that we saw listed were not strictly engineering, right? So if you're transitioning from another position, you see like analytics, meaning, you know, even if you worked with like Excel data, but you performed analysis, right? Uh, communication, agile, like have you worked in a tech company before? Uh, data management, business intelligence, machine learning, right? Like these are, you know, that analytics skill set, right? There, you see them really scattered across the skills that people are looking for. Obviously, there is, you know, the typical engineering skills as well. But when you get to your uh, resume, you want to be highlighting that, right? So it's very typical for me, you know, at the end of uh, our program, um, at the end of the course, I basically interview the student, you know, I, I talk to them for, you know, 30, 40 minutes, because for many students, they've done things related in their past jobs, but they're not in their resume, right? So this is like just very, very typical. So, you know, what things that I'm looking for, have they worked with SQL before in their past, you know, positions that should obviously be listed in the interview? Have they done data analysis, even if it's with Excel, any engineering or working with engineers? Um, have they worked with like data collection, data quality, even if that means looking at the ground level, right? Like, oh, we saw, you know, we know that we can't rely on this data or this doesn't translate at, on the ground or I, I have to train people how to enter in data properly. Well, that's not, that may not seem super technical, but for uh, a data engineering role, people want to make sure that you're not just have your head in the SQL query, but are thinking about how this translates on the ground, right? Product ownership development, right? This shows that, uh, you know, you, you can kind of think through a project end to end, uh, that you can think about what's, uh, what's needed and then execute on it. Um, and, and it shows, you know, that essentially your employer trusts you to a certain degree. So these types of uh, positions are good. And that you also understand maybe like product development just in general in that life cycle. Um, so anything related to that, I would kind of, I would highlight and, and have that come through in your resume. Data storytelling, uh, data visualization, right? These um, this can be a component of the job. So highlighting this as well. And then, you know, related domain, like marketing, finance, or lots of data engineering jobs where they, you know, essentially you're helping the business run. Uh, and then there's like bio jobs as well. And then finally, like sometimes I'll see people leave out, like they're, like some of this, you know, some of the, of the students that I've taught are really, really excellent in terms of like athletics or music, things like that. And, include that in your resume because, you know, as uh, like one CEO told me, it's just like, you know, excellent people are just like excellent, right? Like if you have excellence in one field that takes a lot of, you know, discipline, self-learning, uh, passion, right? Like they'll believe that you can, or they'll give you the benefit of the doubt that you can bring that to something else that you're passionate about, right? So yeah, absolutely. If you, you know, played on your college basketball team or something along those lines or, or won some awards, Put that somewhere on your resume. Um, if nothing else, you know, people will probably ask you about it. General tips, you know, other things that I'm kind of always kind of asking uh, when I look at resumes or trying to improve them is you want to show that you're on the path to becoming a data engineer, right? So maybe you've done some analytics in the past or product development in the past, and now you're, you know, you've built these projects and that is leading you into, you know, the data engineering role. So your, your resume should kind of tell that story, you wanna shape it so that it does. 
Um, the other thing, just like with every line is, uh, and this I got from, I think the CEO of Prefect, he, he's like, He's like, when I read a, uh, read a resume, it's like, so what, so what, so what? With every line, you know, why are you telling us this? Okay, so, you know, they, they're they trying to read, how does this fit into our role? How does this skill set help us? So having that question in the back of your mind with every line is, is useful. Uh, one thing I'll also ask, you know, uh, students to try to figure out what they really did, what's, what's impressive about what they did, is what was hard or interesting about your job? Right? Like, what was the challenging part? And oftentimes that is something you'll want to highlight. Or like, what problem did you mainly work on in your job? And then I, I just, you know, just as an example, I took actually a couple lines from the bottom of my resume. This is something I, you know, uh, I did a number of years ago, but I worked for, here's the beginning, worked for a mobile banking startup. So this is like the before, and then this is the after. Worked for a mobile banking startup to formulate and execute strategies to optimize performance at the customer salesperson management level, uh, devise plans for targeting, determining and targeting most profitable customers, discovering best practices among Salesforce, drafted the Salesforce contract governing Echo's 1,000 agents. So just like things off the top, this can go. You know, like this doesn't really relate to data engineering, right? Like, uh, I, I don't want to kind of distract from this from the point, you know, that I could be making, which is that hey, like this involves some degree of analytics to do this and, and thinking through how what we can use from the data. So, you know, this is my revised version. Uh, worked for the mobile banking startup company. Probably can really remove that word to optimize performance at the customer, salesperson, and management level. So, one, I just I made it shorter. Uh, worked with engineering team to devise database queries, right? Which is, you know, it, that targeted the most profitable customers. So this means like, you know, maybe they wrote the code, but like I was at this point, I was really thinking through, you know, how can we use our data? The most successful sales force and curbed employee fraud use data to develop hypotheses regarding custom, custom, companies target customers and top sales force ver verified qualitatively, then used insights for targeting customers and Salesforce going forward. So this line here is like, okay, how did I thought through how we were going to use the data, right? Um, you know, how is this going to translate and be useful for us going forward? So many times, you know, uh, when working with, when we kind of, if you hire like a data scientist or uh, someone in analytics, an issue is, okay, they do all this work, but what can we really do, do with it afterwards? Right. And so you want to show that follow through that you're someone that, that can do that. Right. But the point is, this is now I'm thinking through, OK, how can I show I'm useful as a data engineer that like even if I haven't done data engineering, I know how to use uh, data in the database. And I know how, you know, I, I know kind of how to verify that data. I'm thinking through how it's used on the ground. And then, I, you know, I've actually uh, uh, executed on it going forward. All right, so those, you know, that's the resume. I, 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 hopefully, like, you submit your resume enough times, you're going to get some interviews. Um, so what are they looking for? So, you know, we could go through this section, I could have gone through kind of the typical questions, tell me about yourself, uh, tell me a time that you've worked with a team, things like that. But I think like, regardless of what questions they're asking for, they're, they're asking, there are certain things they're looking for. And regardless of the answers you give, this is something that you want to convey, right? As you know, like, like you can say the right words, but if you're not conveying this, there, it, it's not going to matter so much, right? So the main, like one just typical thing is that you're a pleasant professional, right? And so I, I have the word pleasant and professional, right? Both are key. Um, so speak positively about all past, you know, experiences. Don't say everything was good, but like now every, just when you walk into the interview, everything was good. Like you're happy about all your past uh, experiences. I say like own your past accomplishments, right? You don't have to downplay what you did, but at the same time, don't be arrogant, right? This doesn't mean that, you know, it's lucky for this company to hire you. You don't know, you know, the good work that they're doing um, or that you are, you know, you want to just say, okay, like, yeah, this was really, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky that I was given this opportunity. I love doing it. Right. You want, so, you know, be uh, just, just, you, you want to come across that you'll be a, a great contributor, but that they're not, you're not going to be someone that rubs people the wrong way. And then finally, at the same time, you know, I say like, enjoy it, right? Like this is an opportunity for you to think back on 
past uh, projects that you worked on that you are proud of. This is an opportunity for you to meet uh, an interesting company, right? So they're looking, you know, you don't have to be super nervous about it because, you know, you're talking about things that you know uh, and things that you can look back on fondly. So that's kind of the attitude you want to have. So this is one thing, right? Um, the second thing is just, can you speak clearly? Uh, and sometimes what I'll hear is people will be that are very social, um, think that they have no issues then communicating, but, you know, speaking in a professional setting means that we want to make sure that you can really communicate your thoughts, um, that, uh, you speak in a relatively organized fashion. Why, why is this valuable to companies? One clear, clear speaking communicates clear thinking. Right. It's very it's, I say it's a prerequisite to speaking clearly is thinking clearly. Right. And then two, obviously, as a data engineer, you may be one of only a few data engineers for the company. So being able to communicate to the tech team or to other people uh, that are not technical is is very valuable to them. So things that I recommend write an outline. Uh, it doesn't have to be super fancy. Like this kind of counts as an outline. Right. Uh, heading sub point heading sub point. Right. And then here's the overall topic. Here's what they, they look for. So just being able to say, okay, I was a product owner of this uh, tech stack. As a product owner, I did X, Y, and Z, right? Another thing is problem to solution. So you may say, okay, the company had an issue with X. So I did, you know, so we had to do this. Using these guidelines is really helpful. Telling about the problem and then how you help to solve it, right? Helps for people really frame why you were doing this. It's good for kind of like storytelling, people keeping engaged. And then same thing with like speaking about the tech stack. Okay, we set up this data pipeline, but we didn't have a way to automate this and to make sure, you know, that these steps are performed in sequence. For that, we use Prefect, right? Talk about the problem first and then uh, how it was used to, you know, how you solved it, right? And that shows that you understand you know, that you're not just using these tools because someone put them on a slide, but that you understand how they solve the problem. And then the last thing is that you're interested in the position, right? Obviously, people care about this because they want to make sure that you're going to be an engaged worker. Um, and they, if you just think about how much more value you get out of an engaged worker than someone who is not engaged in their job, it's enormous, right? Um, they, if, especially if you're breaking in, they don't expect you to have all the tech skills. They know that they're going to have to train you, but they want to see that you're going to ramp up and you're going to be interested in ramping up as quickly as possible. They're kind of like taking, a, you know, investing in you almost, and they want to see that ROI. So the main way is, it, for me at least, is like, okay, here's what I did in the past. Here's kind of what I want to be and, and be as a professional in the future. And so this opportunity is the perfect next step for me, is the perfect thing for me to get there, right? And one thing that I would do is I would look at my resume, actually, you know, put the resume in front of me, put the job description of the place I'm applying for on the other side and try to essentially draw a line between what I did in the past, what this is going to allow me to do in the future, right? And, and really convince myself before I walk into the interview. Um, and then here, is, you know, kind of goes along those lines is make it genuine, like actually find something that you're interested in and a reason why you this uh, is exciting to you. So read their blog, uh, read about what their company is involved in, read about, you know, the team's LinkedIn profiles, what they did. You know, if, you know, if nothing else, you can read about pe people's past experiences and have a good conversation with them. Uh, so what interests you, uh, what really genuinely interests you about that? I mean, it, it, you, it sh you should be able to find that if you're uh, really aspiring for this position. Go on their GitHub, you know, see if they have a GitHub and poke around on their code. Like, like this is ways for you to really show that you're genuinely interested. All right. So after you pass the behavioral interview, then there's, you know, take home. You know, so there's two types of things. Some companies will have you do take home projects. I think you'll see this maybe anecdotally in about like one third. Um, but you, you'll come across this relatively quickly. Uh, so typical thing is, you know, we have kind of sales data. Um, it'll have dimensions about like time, product, maybe being sold, sold the branch. Um, and it will probably be like in a CSV. So they want to see you load the data, query the data, present your findings about some insights about the data. Um, why they care about this? Well, this is, you know, good ETL project. It requires you to do data modeling. It, you know, has you think, like we're saying, like on the ground about, okay, what's missing from the data? How clean is this data? Dupl you know, do we have duplicate data? So it's making you think, you know, how, 
how reliable is this data and what can we do to make this data more reliable? Um, and then finally, it has you do like an analytics project. So for this, I say, you know, break it down by these different dimensions and show conclusions supported by evidence, right? So, you know, if you think back to my slide of, oh, like, you know, data engineering is a good field to be going into. And then I have the evidence, right? I have uh, underneath that, here's the chart showing, you know, how quickly data engineer positions are growing and that they're available to entry level people. And then I say like data storytelling, right? Things are going well, but, you know, like here's what's good about, you know, what we found, but like, here's this issue. So there might be an opportunity, you know, with these few things. So they're, they're see, they want to see that type of thing. Um, one, one good book for this is Say It With Charts. There are a lot of good books. This is just quite short to say it with chart books. So I think you can get a lot of bang for your buck out of it. Oh, and one other thing I said was, you know, Kaggle, Kaggle has this M5 competition. This is Walmart data uh, of like different stores, products they sold, you know, across a lot of period of time. You can, you know, it's a very popular competition. So you can see how past people analyzed it and you can also practice it yourself. All right, we're getting to the end. So then, you know, finally, like technical inter other, you know, the technical interviews, we essentially already covered this, right? It's mostly SQL, there's Python. Um, you know, these nine questions, they're all good for you to go through. And then I would say just re, you know, do them again. <laughs> like if you do them once, do them again. Um, and then here are some resources for you to practice with. And we talked about beginning database design. Um, some general advice on these is just lots of times these will be timed, especially like SQL questions. I find like they'll just give you a quiz and it's timed. So practice doing these questions under time. Um, maybe not the first time you do it, I'd say go through it slowly, maybe not even the second time, but as you, it may, after you're doing this for a little while, yeah, time yourself on this and try to make sure you can do this quickly. I wish they weren't, but they are. Um, track the questions you struggle with. So if you do these leak code problems and you're messing up on a couple different uh, issues, just circle them, right? Have a note, uh, a notebook uh, where you write down what issues you're messing up and do them again and again, and be diagnostic about why you're um, why you're messing them up. So maybe it's, you know, window functions are messing you up, or maybe it's the difference between window functions and aggregates. Um, right then at that point, you just want to go, go back and, uh, and, and study up those subjects and then go do these problems again. So I, I'd say like, you don't have to just go from, if you just go from question to question to question without really seeing a pattern or learning, right? That's not useful. You wanna, you know, use these things, see where you're messing up, verify that you're improving by going back and doing the same problem again. And that's that's essentially it. You know, the, the final round interview, uh, like, like I said, I think you just, you're, if you can talk the talk, if you can kind of be pleasant, if you can explain that you know what you're doing and feel like you're really becoming a peer, you know, that's what they're, that's essentially what they're looking for at that stage is, okay, is this a coworker I want to work for, uh, both technically and culturally? And uh, I think, you know, just additional resources um, at the very end, you know, the inner game of work is, uh, it, it is a really good book for just like figuring out, okay, why you want to do something. And I think it will help you in interviews. Um, it, just, it also has good uh, advice for job searching. This is a, a Ruby book, but for object oriented design, it's, it's like a classic. It's excellent. Obviously cracking the coding interview, Kaggle for like some of the data analysis work, the MLOps community, and then my school, we have a bunch of free curriculum. So if you are, you know, looking to learn like Docker or PySpark, um, you know, we, we have that just for free. They can just click on and go through those resources. And that's everything. That was super packed with valuable information and a lot of people, uh, maybe I can just share my screen and show it to you uh, where it is. So they say, yeah, this one, no question. Just wanted to say, this is a great talk. And uh, this is what I see also in uh, the comments. Uh, amazing talk. Thanks a lot. One thing I see quite a lot in comments is people ask you for slides. Maybe you can quickly share. I, I think it's a Google yeah. Docs, right? Maybe yeah, you can quickly Docs. share like view, views only. Yeah, and then yeah. I will uh, put the link to. And then while you're doing this, um, 
I just wanted to add a comment. You mentioned this Gang of Four book. Mm -hmm. I think it's a super dry book. Like it's uh, <laughs> like I was trying to like when I was getting started. This book is super old, right? So when I was getting started, um, was it like 12 years ago? This book was already old back then. And I was trying to read this, and it was like, okay, why am I am I reading this? I don't understand. I think and C plus plus. Why do I torture myself with this thing? Yeah. <laughs> Just because somebody is telling me uh, to read this. And what I found out is um, there is a different book called Head First uh, Design Patterns. I have mm. it here. This one. It's more accessible. Like it's it talks about mm, the same patterns, most of them, not all of them, but it's like. Uh, it's more engaging to read and it doesn't bore me to death. Uh, right. So that's... <laughs> I, I think it's really fair, yeah. yeah. This is a good book. Gangs, Gang of War is a good book. book. Uh, I don't have anything against this book. This is a great book. Uh, but I, like you have to have some discipline to go through this. Maybe a bit of experience to really understand what I, they talk about. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, there's a talk there, so you know i started learning software engineering actually in ruby so a lot of my advice uh or like object-oriented programming advice comes from there uh i can put in tuta costa like I, there i wrote said like a really i'll put it in the chat um if you look at his uh ruby on rails talk um he he has a really good it's just like a 40 minute talk on basically how to refactor uh, uh messy code into objects and then another person who's probably like more famous in the ruby community is abdi grim um he wrote um he wrote a book he wrote he gave a couple of different talks uh that are also like really useful um, about writing clean functions and again like i think of like function uh, functions are almost like the sentences of your, uh, you know, if you think of your code base as a report, functions are like a clean sentence, right? And then objects are the, are the paragraphs. So, you know, kind of writing clean functions is like the essence uh, of clean code. Okay. Yeah. So we have quite a lot of questions that we need to go through. I don't know if we can <laughs> cover all of them, but let's try. Uh, so the first one, wouldn't it better to keep the 100 plus agents parts in some, sometimes they say it is better to have some information supported with numbers. I think it it's a question about your, oh, I how see. you wrote a part of your CV, right? Oh yeah, yeah, I see. So yeah, I think maybe having the numbers uh, you can you can put that in there, but it's like, what do you, so just always think about what are you trying to get across? So uh, maybe what you're trying to get across with the 1000 plus agents is, okay, this would, you know, the complication of it. Um, but what, what the overall thrust of what you're get, trying to get across is that, okay, this was data-driven, you know, when you were involved. And that involved, even if, you know, before you learned SQL, that you were thinking through how to use the data. And, you know, as an engineer, I kind of know the difference between kind of knowing the, the syntax of SQL and seeing the data in the database and thinking through a query like that can extract value. That's really a big part of the hard part. So you want to communicate that in the resume. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think the overall thing is, what are what are you trying to get across right if you say a thousand plus agents that's probably good because it gets across okay this was a real problem we had to analyze you know a good amount of data even though a thousand isn't that large maybe that's what you're trying to get across and uh, my impression was uh, from listening uh, when i was watching maybe i didn't get it right that it wasn't super relevant to actually the data engineering yeah, uh, yeah. that was the more thing was you know to, and I think this goes to like another point is I, I felt like I was removing the thrust, you know, like here I'm trying to tell the story in this resume of, okay, I had these data engineering roles and all of a sudden I have something about, okay, I write, wrote this contract. Like, what does that have to do with data engineering? Like as a, as an, a hiring manager, I'm con my brain is constantly trying to connect the resume to the role and that doesn't help me. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on. Uh, every job posting I see asks for experience. How does one get an interview in the field without experience? I guess this is like the chicken and egg problem. It's like you need yeah. to have experience to get a job, but to get a job, you need to have experience. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is where, again, open source, uh, 
it can can really help you know because i mean there i say there's a couple of things so one you know open source can help with this working you know doing kind of uh even like contract work if it's like sql or python if you're ready to do that can help with that and then put that in your linkedin right because when you apply for linkedin they see your uh past experiences right away that's what just shows up uh on LinkedIn when you like click through the resumes so you want to have those experiences uh listed you know uh, right there so they're like oh this guy's kind of done the job and then the uh, so that's you know uh, one piece of advice is like kind of doing the open source, put that in your LinkedIn. Another piece of advice is, again, like think through the job that you actually had, like sometimes and translate it to tech. Like, were you like a product owner, you know, in some way? Did you do, do project management? Did you uh, did you work with SQL or Python in a past job? Can you move into a role like that in your current job? Right. Uh, you know, where you're doing more SQL and then put that in the description of your um, you know, of your role, right? And then finally, if you do, you know, if you take some courses online or things like that, put put that there. Um, and then finally, then the last thing everyone says, which is true, is take this with a grain of salt, the years of experience, they're looking for people with these skill sets. Um, and if you have the skill sets, you, I, I think, I, th I really think you'll, I haven't seen a case where someone has clearly had the skill set and not been able to land a job. So focus more on like uh, maybe also portfolio projects, right? So it can also be experience. Like if it's a problem that you solve for you, but this is a real problem, not just, you know, you found a data set on Kaggle and did this, but this is really great. And uh, I also hire people, not for data engineering though, but I really love talking about these kind of pet projects people did. It shows many things like that. They, they really like this field. They are ready to go the extra mile there patient about what they do and uh, and it it also gives us something to talk about on the interview right yeah and i would just like underscore what you just said about you know go the extra mile are patient about what they do because it, it's it goes back to okay you click on the code of a project and you're like where is the where is the code like where where is something beyond the kind of generic that you generally see um, that's where, you know, you're communicating, you know, that passion and that interest, uh, through your project. So another question from Srikanth, uh, Srikanth, will expertise in AWS certification add value to data engineering and help in getting the role? Yeah, I, I think that it does. Um, I, at the same time, uh, in, in like, sometimes it's a bit. Uh, the skill sets that are required for an AWS role is uh, beyond what you need. We're kind of a little bit off track. So I'd still say, you know, the main thing, if you can, uh, I would say, I say overall, you first want to make sure you've nailed down the Python and SQL skills. Like that, that's where I would put your energy. So if you are kind of like passing, you know, the SQL medium to hard problems and you're getting, you know, Python beginner, maybe, maybe up to medium, you have this project and then you want to add an AWS certificate, AWS certification. Okay, cool. Um, but if you're looking for data engineering, I'd say first get those check marks first, you know, AWS certification could be more for like cloud engineering uh, type role. Mm -hmm. And maybe I will add to that, that nobody cares whether you have a certificate or not. People at least uh, like it will not uh, uh, leap, like you will still need to do a test. You will still need to do a live coding, right? So then like the certificate doesn't really show, like right. doesn't give you any advantage, right? But what gives you is actually knowing these things. Right? Right. So if you know AWS, nobody cares whether you have a certificate or not. I would, and that goes for every skill set. <laughs> like, like right. if you have, it doesn't matter if you have the skills, like if you have the certificate, have the certificate, like people only, that maybe will get you in the door, but very quickly they're gonna find out whether or not you actually have the skill. Mm -hmm. I have 20 years of experience in an unrelated field and have built up the skills and project portfolio. How do I convince recruiters to give me an interview? Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious as to like why, you know, I'd want to look at the portfolio, uh, project portfolio, like where you're not getting the interview. I mean, one thing to do is maybe start networking. But in my in my experience, if you lit are listing the skills on LinkedIn, you have, you know, a link to your GitHub, um, you should start getting uh, interviews. So I, I'm speaking basically from experience of my students 
who come from, you know, some of them have similar backgrounds, but have, you know, gotten reached out to uh, from recruiters. Um, one thing you could do is uh, maybe work for like, like, see if you can volunteer your services a little bit, like just do something part time. Uh, so, you know, when you see these kind of positions or like the open source, like I said, is very good. Um, but yeah, in my experience, you know, just having teaching students that come from past backgrounds, they're generally able to get interviews. That's not where they get stuck. So I would just make sure that your code, do you really have the SQL and Python in there? Does it look like clean code? Things like that might be why you're not getting uh, through. Mm -hmm. It might also depend on the location where you're in. Like maybe yeah. in New York City, it's a very hot market, right? But in other, uh, like I don't know, in Ohio or like any other city, maybe it's not so, uh, like they, they look more for people with experience. Um, so do you have any maybe suggestions for people who are based in these geographies where data engineering is not in so much demand as maybe in NYC? Um, I mean, well, one thing I'd say, is, like, well, in the US, generally, you're still a, like, people, I think at this point are still able to get the positions with kind of like remote. I, when it comes to kind of other countries, maybe outside of Europe, I think it is, can be more challenging if their job is not located in their country. Um, so that's one thing, uh, unfortunately, that I feel like is the case. At that point, you probably will have to rely more on networking, meaning, you know, you know, a lot of these kind of like open source projects or meetups, slacks, right? Like you can, then talk to people face to face and but at that point you really have to be kind of like that peer right you should you should kind of have the other check marks there meaning you showed that you can do the job one, one thing i you know was almost going to put in the uh talk is no one's going to like networking enough will not get you a job if you don't have the skills like people are not going to recommend you for a position just only because they like you right if you don't have the skills the reason why is because one you're not going to get the job anyway right and then two um you know for that person that's going to they're, they're going to be seen as not making great recommendations to the employer so it's going to taint the relationship with the employer so even me you know for my students like I'll, I'll only recommend a student like for a position when I know I think they're going to be a good fit. It's not doing anyone any favors for me to recommend someone who's not ready yet. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, does Jigsaw, Jigsaw Labs have any free resources for data analysis, data science, as opposed to data engineering? Yeah, we have we have a ton uh, like intro to machine learning, building a neural, neural network from scratch with uh, PyTorch, uh, Pandas you know, things like that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So how do do people find it? Just Oh, yeah, just go to uh, jigsawlabs.io. Uh, um, and then you can like, yeah, jigsawlabs.io. Yeah, press return. And then click on free courses. And then, you know, you just scroll down. So this is, uh, you know, me teaching my mom, pandas, Docker, Where? Uh, this right Where here. You see the, the the video? This one, right? Yeah, yeah, that oh, one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. um, uh, Docker, Spark, uh, Intro to Machine Learning, Neural Networks with PyTorch. So all of these you don't have to log in for. They're just uh, collabs. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Hey, what are the best resources for learning Snowflake and practical implementation, production-based, keeping in mind i want to implement it with my startup team right okay so there so one the documentation at snowflake is really good and lots of times they will have essentially like tutorials uh, as to how to go through things um there are a couple i think for me just like getting started there are a couple of like youtube talks that were like an hour plus long that i really you know enjoyed and kind of got started with uh one thing to note is that you know snowflake still is mainly sql right um so it's like you get started maybe you learn about like staging and snowflake and things like that but, but that's not too much a lot of it's really just like navigating uh you know the interface and then writing sql and then going through documentation as you go through it uh, maybe a little bit more tricky is then understanding just like how snowflake works under the hood um but you can you can get that through the documentation and through some of those youtube talks 
Do you have time for a couple of more questions? Yeah, sure. So I see that uh, this one probably will take an hour. Or <laughs> yeah, but, uh, fair enough. I think we talked about like uh, just to read this. So this the question is about uh, how Jeff transitioned uh, from being a lawyer to software engineering. I think if I go to Data Talks Club, actually it's not the first time Jeff is here on Data Talks Club. Um, so we had this teaching data engineers uh, podcast episode, and I think at the beginning uh, when uh, we talk about Jeff's background, you can talk a bit about, you can see, we, we talked a bit about that. Mm. So maybe that will answer your question. Um, I know, do you want to add anything to that? Maybe you had some other interviews where you talked about that? No, it's mainly just, uh, um, you know, working at a startup. And then it, like I kind of in that resume section, right? That's real. That was really the startup where I started. They, they were really like, oh, well, we're too busy to do this SQL query for you, but here's a book on SQL, go for it. So <laughs> thanks. I am autistic. It is a challenge explaining my thinking process when speaking mm -hmm. to someone I have not met before. Do you have any advice on how can I approach interviews? I wonder if you can write down your thought, you know, say, hey, can I have a moment? Actually, you know, it, it would just be helpful for me if I can gather my thoughts. Do you mind? Right. And write down, take your time and, and write down a couple of notes and then go through them. I still th I think that that will uh, communicate, show that, OK, I am thinking clearly or can, you know, think through a problem. Um, you know, and I just need, you know, to kind of lean on notes when, and that's not, I would, I personally wouldn't find that, I would find that fine, you know, if someone's able to do that. Mm -hmm. And from my experience as a person who is hiring people, I remember I interviewed a person, I don't know if um, uh, that person was autistic or not, I didn't ask, of course, uh, but um, like that person would uh, just before answering question would think a bit, take a note without even asking if it's okay. Uh, like I thought it's totally okay. Like everyone is different, right? Everyone needs uh, to process information differently. So they would just jot down something on a piece of paper. It was still in the time when we had face-to-face -face interviews, right? So they would think, uh, write something on the paper and then answer. And also, especially when the questions were more like on the technical side of things. And that was totally fine, right? So we hired that person at the end. Um, but every, everyone is different, right? And uh, that's fine. Okay, what's the modern data warehouse uh, modeling approach? Yeah, I don't know your experience, Alexi, but I think that it varies uh, to a degree from like company to company. Um, so yeah, you'll hear you know about like uh, like Star Schema and Snowflake Schema and whatever is dead. Um, I'd say for beginners, I recommend, you know, I, I'm like starting to realize this now more like as we go through the bootcamp a few times, I recommend just really knowing OLTP because then it becomes more flexible down the line, but you should have OLTP, you know, like kind of like whatever that third normal form, like know that well, because there are strict rules and then, and, and reasons for those rules. And then once you learn that and you start realizing, you know, learning, okay, here's why analytics is modeled differently, right? You have that perspective. Um, so if you're breaking in, I recommend, you know, first have down OLTP. I think it's hard enough for students to really master. Um, and then, you know, understand the trade-offs, right? And that it's more about that. Just understand the trade-offs as to, okay, why is that not always followed in an OLAP database? Yeah, and uh, just a shameless plug. So we had another talk from Rahul Jain about modern data warehouse, where he goes into quite a lot of details about what it is and how to design uh, such a warehouse. So check it out. So it's on uh, in our channel called Modern Data Warehouse. It's a bit clickbaity, I must admit, because like who knows what modern data warehouse is? Like it can mean pretty much everything, right? But uh, yeah, that's a good talk. Check it out. And uh, yeah, maybe like uh, let's take the last one. I don't know, Jeff. How much time do you have? Do you have uh, time I'm, for? I, yeah, I'm I'm available. Okay, so let's take maybe because we have so many questions and people sure. are quite engaged. So, quick question about projects for a portfolio. Where can we find the ideas for a project which would be good? How many projects are ample? I guess it means yeah, enough, right? Before yeah. we apply. 
Okay, so the last part of the question, I say you just need one good project. Like if you if you have one good, like re, and really like I would put your energy. Uh, maybe you have some other projects for kind of like learning different skills. I think that's cool. But in terms of uh, you know uh, what you're going to be showing when people ask for a project, they're just going to be looking at one. So you so you so just concentrate your efforts into one kind of portfolio project. Um, okay, where can you find ideas for the project? will be good. So there's a couple of things. One is actually, if you look at like past um, take home assignments, uh, like for interviews, a lot of that, like, you know, you can kind of maybe find some online things like that, or just apply to a few jobs and you'll get a couple. They turn, we turn them into a nice portfolio pro like project. A lot of them will involve ETL. So then you code them out. Um, and then, you know, from there, let's say you, uh, you automate them with Airflow, right? Like you can you can really make deploy it with Docker and put it on AW, right? Like you can really make that real pretty quickly. Um, in terms of finding examples for for some of them, um, let's see. Well, you can like I, I did mention some good, you know, 18F uh, just in terms of like clean code. Do you have a, some ideas? I, I do just keep talking. Sorry, maybe <laughs> this is distur distracting. Yeah. But I, so, I, I do have an idea, but I don't want to interrupt your. Uh, what you I would say think. also, you know, look at like open source. You can go to maybe some companies that have good data engineering uh, teams and and look at you know their open source projects. Um, and then you know look at a code base like Prefix code base or things like that. See how it's organized. And then finally, I would say. Look at um, just look at Flask projects because they have a lot of it down. You know, if you look at uh, who is it, like Miguel Grinberg, I believe, right, has like the large Flask project. A lot of like the organization of that code, right, it has models, it has you know SQL in there, it has you know all the you know layouts of the files. You know, it has good code hygiene, in other words. And you know that's just a, kind of a first step. You again, like so much of it is showing you can code. And uh, while maybe this is not a good example of uh, great hygiene, I like cook cold, I would say, I just wanted to, to mention that uh, we had a data engineering course and then at the end uh, there was a part with projects and students uh, of this course did a lot of amazing projects and you can find them by going to data engineering Zoom camp, then week seven project, and you can just see this uh, peer reviewing assignments and you can just see the like the project that students submitted not all of them or I don't know why it's actually not working maybe they removed the project after the course but some of these um, projects like they're pretty good like they have uh, good readme uh, like maybe in terms of code uh, because uh, this was created by students so maybe in terms of code they are not always top notch but in terms of ideas many of them are quite good so you can check these projects or for courses like this, similar ones, uh, maybe in some universities, they make this public as well, right? And then you can see what other students did and you can get some inspiration from this. Um, yeah, so there are quite a few amazing projects, so check it out, uh, you will find something in interesting, I'm sure. Um, does learning C before Python make one a good data engineer? I would say like having any coding experience before, you know, prior, coding experience, especially if you worked on the job, uh, is a great, you know, setup, right? Meaning you you still need to learn Python, but learning Python will, one, will be easier for you. And being an engineer, as like any engineer, it involves a lot of different skill sets, right? From understanding like the product development cycle to, you know, having good, like clean gets, get commits to, uh, you know, knowing how to really like translate client specifications into code, working with a large code base, like that is a great, you know, background. The language doesn't matter, you know, it, regardless of what language you've coded in prior, you know, if you've done that professionally or extensively, like you, you should be, you know, people will see a lot of value in that. And just a side note, C is a terrible language. I mean, it's good for some use cases, but as a general <laughs> purpose, language uh, like you'll suffer with this most of the time like memory management and all that mm -hmm. it is just too difficult and most of the time you don't need that um, oops I think I just closed uh, the one so that one that I just accidentally closed was about uh, somebody had 
bad experience with recruiters that they're fighting that person through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what they mean and how to avoid that? I mean, I, I wonder what the experience was. I mean, one thing I would say is in my experience, like recruiters, uh, it, it's like, okay, my perspective on recruiters is there, like I, you hear a lot of, uh, you know, negative comments about recruiters on LinkedIn and things like that, especially when it comes to beginners. One thing I just say is like recruiters are not technical, so they don't know whether or not you have the skills or what it means to have the skills. All they can do essentially is try to maintain the relationship and look at like years of experience, a graduate, whatever, as a proxy, you know? So if you kind of like have that perspective, they're not trying to be like malicious. They really just it's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to like put someone that doesn't know what they're doing in front of a company. And then I never get to do that again. Right. Um, it, you know, but I don't know that person's experience, but I think that, you know, if that being said, if you kind of then develop a relationship with a recruiter that is kind of, uh, trustworthy or, or wants to make sure there's actually a good fit between you and the company, that's, that can be a real asset. You know, I've seen that happen already with some of my recent graduates. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Unfortunately, I have to go now. We still have a lot of questions. Maybe we will figure out how to actually uh, deal with them offline. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to thank you one more time for coming today, for sharing your expertise with us. That was a talk packed with information and the questions you gave at the end were also great. So thanks again, Jeff. And thanks everyone for watching this, for asking questions. To yeah, maybe like if somebody wants to follow up with a question uh, with you, how can they find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, you know, just Google Jeff Katz, Jigsaw Labs. Uh, you can also obviously like go to the website and if you want to, you know, schedule some time to talk or something like that, just click on the talk with us button. Um, you know, our, our next course is starting uh, in a few weeks. So if you're interested in the course, like I'd say you, you want to, we have a technical interview, so you do want to get on that and uh, just schedule some time to talk with me. Okay, thanks again. And uh, that was a pleasure talking to you as always. Thanks so so yeah, have uh, the great rest of your day.